think the first thing I need to do, if I'm allowed to take a, just a moment of personal privilege, is uh, uh, thank everyone for uh, all the kind words, emails, uh, uh, thoughts, prayers, uh, when, you know, during the, uh, the transition. Uh, very much appreciated. And uh, if I was right in the scenario to come into a job like this, uh, uh, the, the conditions would probably be a little different. Uh, and I think that uh, you know, last year, from a budget standpoint, it was brutal. And uh, those of you that, that were here understand and uh, I know don't need to be reminded of the sacrifice that, uh, that everyone made. Uh, it was uh, noticed, very much appreciated, and uh, uh, we're working hard to make sure that we go forward. This is uh, actually the title of the book, and those of you maybe that are my age or maybe a little older may remember Dr. Schuler, his hour of power that came on uh, on TV, he's a televangelist, tele and uh, uh, maybe not quite as uh, as far out there as some of the others. Uh, really, uh, his message was one of uh, uh, positive thinking, more along the lines of Norman Vincent Field. This is a book that came out about uh, oh, when I was about a sophomore in college, and uh, those of you that have been alive that long know that uh, the country was just coming through a really rough time with the recession, and inflation. And, uh, and so that, uh, I did read the book, it's been 30 years ago, so uh, I can't recite it uh, by the verse, but uh, the title has always stuck with me, and it's, uh, it's meaningful, and, uh, and I think there is a, uh, there's a lot to that. Uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about who we are, we're going to talk about the budget. We're going to talk about the challenges that we face with that budget, a little bit about how we're going to get through these challenging times. We're going to change gears. We're going to talk about some of the accomplishments that we had last year, uh, in which there are many, and I'll apologize right up front if I left somebody out. Uh, but I know that uh, you would like to get out of here today, and if we tried to include all the accomplishments, uh, that would extend this talk way past uh, your ability to sit there. So, uh, but one thing that I've discovered in the past 60 days, it is amazing, amazing, of how many people that I talk to locally in Muskogee that doesn't know who Connors, who we are, what we do, and who we serve. Oh, I thought you were four years ago. Don't you have uh, welding programs? You know, so uh, so that uh, kind of made that a mission, uh, a little educational outreach myself, uh, with the help of the uh, marketing department, created a handout, and have been making my way around town and visiting with different leaders and different organizations, and and. Uh, this is who we are, this is the, the students that we serve, and this is what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, and, uh, but I need your help to do that, uh, and I need to arm you with a little information so that, that as you get these questions, you're able to, uh, to go forward and to, uh, and to talk about Connors. I think most of us know our areas very well, and it's easy to get trapped in these little silos. And, uh, but I also think that it's important that, uh, that you know uh, where, uh, kind of where we're at and, and, and what we talk about. Everyone knows in this room that we're a two-year college, open admissions, public, supposedly. Uh, uh, college, you know, we got our start in 1908. Uh, we have campuses in Warner and Muskogee and just how it happens to fall out. The Warner campus is, is um, actually lends itself more for those students who want the more traditional college experience, athletic programs, 
pardon me, dormitories. The Muskogee operation lends itself a little more towards that traditional commuter college uh, model. As Dr. Fulton used to say, the three C's, car, class, car. Maybe not as interested in the student activities. It's harder, Derek, right, to find activities that the Muskogee students are, uh, are really interested in. But Derek does a good job and continues to try. Now, these numbers are a little dated. They're going to change a little bit. But in round numbers, we're going to serve about 3,000 students a year, individual students. Uh, the uh, the breakdown of the student if you if you put this uh, demographic breakdown of any other college in the state it would be different. Nearly half of our students are minority students. We have one of the largest Native American student populations in the state, uh, and we know research tells us that there's some differences in how how people learn. Uh, there's also differences in uh, social economic, uh, from a social economic standpoint. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we uh, were faced with a little different challenges than, say, our neighbors down the road, Carl Albert, or the two year colleges out on the western side of the state, Northern Oklahoma College. Uh, just a, a different mix of students. Uh, Interesting, over time, how this has changed. Only 31% of our students are full-time. 69% are uh, part-time, take fewer than 12 hours. Um, and we've seen our high school concurrent enrollment. This is a couple years old because these numbers are going to get bigger. Um, gives us an opportunity to talk about the Connors, or the, the Accelerate program. We have an Accelerate program from Muskogee High School and for Warner High School. This is a pilot project that we got approved by the state regents. Mrs. O'Quinn, Dr. Dinger, uh, and some other folks worked really hard on putting this proposal together. There's one other pilot project that works with uh, 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 concurrent enrollment and the admissions criteria in the state, and that's at Tulsa Community College. And we were able to, uh, through some negotiation and and uh, and with their help, quite frankly, by the staff at the state regents, to get this program approved. Completed our first year, learned a lot, uh, but had much success. And uh, I think that as uh, as these numbers become a little more. Uh, Available, we're going to share those with you. I had a meeting with uh, Superintendent Guard yesterday. We're going to get some additional information on uh, on these students, and uh, I think that uh, we're really going to see that uh, that we're making a difference with access to higher education. Other demographics that uh, that are I don't know if they're interest you, they interest me. Average age is about 25.5. This age, this average age has came down. It wasn't many years ago that our average age was 27, 28. We also know that the average age at the different campuses, or the average age varies wildly at the different campuses. If we took that down here, probably in the 21 range down here on this campus, probably closer to 27, 28 up at the, uh, up at the Muskogee campus. But uh, you know, we have them in our classroom to get Adult students and traditional students bring a whole different perspective when it comes to the classroom. I don't know about you, but I always like to have an adult or two in the classroom because it makes those kids hump up. Uh, they curve busters. I like it. Uh, you know, get a little more out of it. Average ACT of 19.29, which actually has, has came up around here in the, in the past few years. And that's getting pretty close to the state average on the composite. Uh, so we're, uh, you know, I think that that goes back to the high schools. They're doing a little better job when it comes to preparing students for college. We've got about 350 students that live on campus. Uh, depending on the time of the year, that's going to vary just a little bit. But that's a 
that's a pretty good number. So when they ask, you know, we've got about 350 students that, that, uh, that live on campus. Uh, gender, nearly 70% female, 30% male. I know for a fact that uh, Coach Medford, when he's recruiting young men, uses this graphic. <laughs> Because I've heard him say, young man, if you can't find a girlfriend, I don't know what we can do for you. <laughs> the 55% uh, uh, first-generation college student, once again, that's a risk factor of, of non-completion. That's a pretty high number uh, for an institution. That's probably a little underrepresented. As I remember right, Maddie, that came from the FASTA self-reported came off the fastest, so we know that we're missing some folks in this regard. So that number could possibly be uh, a little higher. <clears throat> Why am I showing you these things, the ethnicities? The, uh, the, the slide that I'm missing up here is, uh, uh, you know, how many of our students uh, qualify for Pell? Well, it, it has to do with the students that we serve and the students that need served and deserve our service, and it's different than the students that are served elsewhere in the state. It's absolutely different than the students that they serve at OU and OSU. How many of you have taught at an OU or an OSU? <clears throat> taught at the University of Tennessee, 24 ACT to get in back then. It's a whole lot easier, a whole lot easier to teach that graphic, that demographic, those students that are, that are that prepared at 24 up to where I realize in your classrooms you have students that may have a single digit for a composite ACT score all the way up into the 30s. And it is a challenge. That makes you a better teacher than those folks at the big schools. They don't have to work as hard as you do. Okay. But we're doing the work that we need to do for this area of the state. 88, nearly 89% of our students are from Oklahoma. Uh, of that 88%, typically, these are round numbers, about half of those students come from Muskogee County. About 80 to 85%, 85% of the in-state students come from within our seven county service area. And I know Logan knows this well with some of the work that she's done in the research and we are very concentrated where our students come from. Why we have some of our different programs so we can reach out and attract students that we normally wouldn't get to this campus and introduce them to this fine institution. Uh, so, uh, uh, and we're going to continue to look at programs to, to attract from a wider range, continue to work and identify students who, uh, who will thrive here. And we think they're out there. Kind of a breakdown of credit hours of uh, of where our students, where the credit hours are generated. Uh, and again, these numbers are going to change this year, but as you can see, uh, uh, most, most the, the largest number of credit hours are generated on the SCOTI operation. You know, generally there's around 1,000 students that, that attend the SCOTI only, about 700 students that attend Warner only, and then the rest of them come from either the prison, they're concurrent enrollment students. Uh, they are totally online. That number is growing for us, which is a good thing. Uh, but uh, that's where the that's where the credit hours are uh, are generated. Really proud of this graphic. In about 2010-2011. Uh, Governor Fallon challenged the higher ed system to increase the number of degrees and certificates being produced in the state 
by two thirds, roughly. And here, and by uh, 20, uh, was that 2027? Had about a 17 year span to increase the number of degrees and certificates generated by two thirds. And if you look at what, uh, what we've been able to do, we put effort into it. Uh, we've tried to do a better job of advising to get students through. We've worked hard on reverse transfer to generate every, you know, to identify students who are just a few hours short. They can transfer them back in and we can get them graduated. Uh, Ms. King and uh, Ms. Knapper have been very involved in that. And we also created a couple of certificate programs that, uh, that run through the nursing program that are legit. A student that finishes the first semester of the nursing program can sit for the CNA certification. Don't, don't let me lie, Joyce. The CNA certification. As they complete the second semester, they're eligible to sit for the LPN, for their LPN license. And so we've created a pathway where a student that uh, to help pay their way through school, they've increased their value with these certificates. Now, it doesn't mean that we award those certificates. Please don't get us in trouble by saying we're giving CNAs and we're giving LPNs. Our, uh, our uh, friends at, uh, at the Career Tech Centers will uh, take offense to that. But they are eligible to sit for that licensure exam. And uh, look at what we've done. Even in the last year of this program, we're only supposed to be producing 463 uh, uh, degrees and certificates annually. We're already way over that. We're, we've blown the top off of it. We're leading the state in this, in this factor. So I'm proud of you. Thank you for all your work. And uh, it, uh, uh, we hope we hope that we're able to continue on this trajectory. We've got challenges that, uh, that we'll talk about in a minute that, uh, that we'll get to that. Here's just a breakdown of uh, students when they attend classes. Uh, most of them, you know, nearly 40% of them attend both day and night classes. Uh, you know, then the, the biggest uh, 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 we've got a, our mix of, uh, of other students that uh, that uh, that attend other directions. And that's kind of hard. Heath did a good job of separating that information out, and I know that was a nightmare to try to peel through all those numbers and and, uh, and get get through that. Um, so all these good things to say, well, budget. Uh, and uh, as we said, last year was extremely tough. I don't have to tell you that. You know what you felt. It. Uh, but here's what our budget looks like for this year. Uh, about 45.4% of our budget comes from auxiliary enterprises. This is money that we raise. This is through the dorms, the bookstore, the bull sale, uh, money that we raise. Uh, tuition and fees, about 25.2%. And uh, state appropriations, that's about 22%. Um, there was a graphic shown this similar in the fall of 2012. This number was 48.9%. Uh, this number was 20.2%. This number was 26%. So you can see what the cuts of the consequences uh, the budget cuts have forced us to shift more of the burden to the student. Okay? Just how the mix, uh, mix rolls up. There seems to be a thought among some members of our legislature uh, that 
a higher education. Traditionally, a higher education has been looked upon as a public good, a public gain. We've got a, a more educated citizenry that attracts higher paying jobs. Those higher paying jobs end up resulting in greater tax uh, revenues. Uh, people with degrees, you can go look at any number that you want to find, any meaningful st statistic, and there's not a downside to getting a higher, uh, you know, a college degree. Lifelong uh, career earnings over a over million dollars. People with college degrees live longer, probably because they got jobs that have health insurance with it. They're less likely to be unemployed. And so uh, the, the thought of these folks is that's become a, a, a personal gain and not a public good. And I haven't understood the rationale of that. Uh, they've apparently convinced themselves that that's the way that it should be and have no desire to fund public higher education. And uh, obviously we're feeling the pain of, of the result of that school of thought. I use this slide just, I added, we add a little information just for, for impact. Here's where we need to start. If we look at FY, last year's budget. Last year's budget was uh, started out at $6.6 .6 million, state appropriations, sorry. Uh, by the time they got done with us, our effective budget was uh, 598 then when they got done with us in uh, this last legislature, our budget is 5.56. Uh, and I think we've got to go back to the early 2000s before we get back to this number again, and maybe before they shrank us that far. Um, so bottom line, with the budget cuts that, uh, the, if we look at it as a whole, higher education as a system was cut $153 million, 15.92%, more than any other state agency, more than any other state agency. Career Tech took about 11% cut, but that mainly affects their operation at Stillwater, does not affect does not affect the career tech schools because they're still got their ad valorem taxes coming in from that big tax base. Okay? Some of these schools, this is the first year that they've actually, they work, they, they have not been able to uh, cover a budget cut with the increases in their ad valorem revenue. Okay? So they're 11% still doing it. Now, Department of Human Services, what, uh, what's happening there is, is deplorable, uh, but higher ed took the biggest cut of uh, anyone. Cost corners, cost corners, a little over a million dollars, as you can do the math. Uh, and uh, then uh, we also found out, and the reasons we're trying to take care of is it just didn't necessarily work out in our favor. But concurrent enrollment, there's legislation out there that says that uh, high school seniors that qualify get uh, six hours a semester tuition free of, of concurrent enrollment. Well, we get reimbursed, supposedly get reimbursed from that. It's always in the rears. Last year we were reimbursed at 70 cents on the dollar. This year that reimbursement is going to be 35 cents on the dollar. And we will have more. This will be a bigger pool of students that uh, that uh, that we'll be dealing with. So when it's all said and done, uh, we're up closer to you know 1.05 million is what the total cut will be, closer to 1.1, and uh, uh, we can uh, and, and that's that's just where we're at. And the question is, why so much? Why so much? The problem with this is there have been some members in Congress or in, in the legislature, in particular a couple, who have been very vocal about, uh, and they are upset with President Bourne at OU over the pension sales tax proposal. 
Uh, and you know, the question is, well, if you're mad at OU, you know, the way the funding system works, if you try to uh, extract it out of their hide, it comes out of our hide too. So, and the other thing is, why are you upset with OU and OSU when they are great institutions? They have world-class programs, um, and so you're upset with them for being successful. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, the penny sales tax, uh, you need to make your own decision on, uh, on that. I think what I, I would say is that there would be no need, <clears throat> this proposal would have never, would have never came up if the legislature would have taken the steps that they need to take to correct things. And, uh, and they chose to kick it. Kick the can down the road and uh, uh, I don't think we have a lot of confidence that uh, how they fix, fix the budget is a, is a long term fix. Uh, did you know that uh, Connor State College Muskogee ended up, the branch campus, ended up on a uh, closure list in the waning days of the, of the state legislature? I'd like to show you the emails. There was an email that was circulated in the, in the House. It was circulated by uh, Representative Todd Thompson, who's from Ada, who has East Central in his district. The reason that he circulated this email was he thought that the cuts went way too far in higher ed. And there were legislators, every institution that was slated or that was on that list for closure had legislators who were letting this happen. They weren't fighting for us. This came about in the waning days of the legislature. We'd already, they'd already taken $153 million. There's a couple of them said, let's go get another $100 million. And so this was how Representative Thompson was able to stop that. Representative Thompson is a true friend to higher education. Not only did he get that stopped, he voted against the budget, which he took some heat from, from the daily Oklahoma, but he voted against the budget because the cuts went too deep in higher ed. And uh, now I will tell you that uh, uh, most of our contingent battled for us, but uh, we ended up on the list, so uh, possibly there's some questions that need to be asked of uh, maybe who was it. Student impact, this is the slide that we use to show around. We reduced scholarships. Uh, of all of our uh, scholarship programs by 15%, the net impact of these students when we take, take into, or the net cut to the scholarship programs, when you take into account increases in well, the dorms, tuition, fees, is actually close to 25%. Tutoring services for our students. Library access, we reduced the number of hours there. Number of courses offered, uh, increased class size. None of those are good things for student learning. We did ask for and receive uh, permission to increase tuition and uh, uh, mandatory fees by 8.75%. Uh, but the thing that uh, we get accused in higher ed, we get lumped in with everyone else. Every time we cut you, you just increase tuition to cover the, cover the loss and it ends up being more. That 8.75% will only cover about a third of the budget hole that's been created. 36% okay? at best. So yes, we did increase uh, tuition but it just comes nowhere near filling the gap that was left by the cut. So how did we do it? Well, here's one place is employee, uh, the impact on the employees. <clears throat> 29 positions unfilled or limited, or uh, eliminated. 
16 of those positions were eliminations, reductions in force. Uh, and that's the guy that had uh, about 13 of those conversations. Uh, not something that I'm interested in, uh, in revisiting. This, uh, also, this is the time we go back. How do we, uh, how do we make it stretch? We cut discretionary sending just as much as we can. Um, essentially, we're on a spending freeze. That means that you are going to have to justify what you spend. If we have to have it to teach class, to operate, then we have to have it. If it is something that we can look down the road, delay, then we need to do that because we've got to make this stretch. Mike Lewis and his crew and the exec team, we worked really hard to put together a budget that was pretty conservative, that has a little buffer in it for something to go sideways. Well, I have no faith that the state fixed the budget problem. I have limited faith that we won't see another mid-year reduction we built in, like I said, a little buffer to handle that, but not much. And so what we do then, and probably the first thing that we'll have to look at is furloughs. So just uh, we're going to do everything we can to uh, for that not to happen, but we need your help uh, to make sure that we squeeze A until he squeals and we can get through this. Uh, this slide has got some traction with the folks that we've worked with. Uh, in 2011, the State Chamber of Commerce did a study. Connors is multiplier for every uh, dollar, state dollar, state appropriation was 5.82, one of the highest in the state. And total uh, regional economic impact of our uh, once the money works its way through the system, was about $66 million. So if we use those numbers and reverse engineer this, take a million dollars away from this, then there's seven and a half million dollars of economic activity that's lost from this region. Who's making that up? And that's the questions that we need to be asking our decision makers. Who's making that up? They will not have an answer because no one is. All right. I don't have a slide for you on enrollment numbers. I was kind of hoping that our numbers looked a little better today than they did yesterday. Our headcount is going to be down by 7-8% when it's all said and done. There's about 100 of those students that were senior citizen swimmers that were included in the, in the total last fall, that we eliminated that program, they're no longer there. They contributed 100 credit hours roughly to our credit hour total. So it will be disproportionate. Uh, you know, our headcount numbers are, going to, are just going to not look good no matter who looks at them, but there's one big factor of why they look that way. Right now on credit hours, if we, uh, uh, we are 6.8% behind on credit hours. For you sports fans, head count credit hours like driving and putting. The head counts for show, just like driving, the putting's for double. Now, last year if we do a comparison, I want to take, take up for Heath because it's hard to get when we've changed systems to get a comparison. Last year at this time, there were 600 credit hours uh, that were counted for from the prisons that aren't accounted for now. So if we put that in, we're inside of 5% on uh, credit hours. I understand that they're busy at, uh, at the Muskogee campus and here. So, uh, we need to stay, we need to get as close to zero as, as we can, and uh, 
the further under five percent that, that we get on credit hours, the better off we're going to be. And we've got a, a little more help on the way that we'll talk about in just a minute on on uh, where we'll uh, where we'll make up some of that ground. The other the last thing I want to talk about here on enrollment numbers is that recruitment and retention is every one of us's responsibility. Every one of us. And it's how we deal with students whenever they come to the front window, at whatever office we deal with, how we deal with them in the classroom. Um, and uh, uh, it, it makes a difference. In 1415, and these are reports that anybody can look at because they're on the State Regents website. We, we're proud of our graduation rate and number of degrees that we, we produce. But our three-year graduation rate for Connors is 16.2%. Now, that's first-time, full-time freshman numbers. Okay? I, need to, I, need to, I need to include that. State average is 19.8. I don't like being there. First time, uh, first year persistence rate, first time, full time, students for the fall semester, Connor State College, 48.5%, state average, 58.8%, dead last. Unacceptable. Now, we're going to help a little bit because in the past, you folks have done a good job with reporting no-shows. What we haven't done is when we get those no-shows reported long enough, we're going to open up that seat and allow a paying customer in. What I would like for you to do, faculty, if you have a no-show on Friday of the first week, somebody that has not been there, has not contacted you, they haven't done anything in Blackboard, we need that information to get to Daniel Edmonds. We're going to try to make contact about one time. And if they're not, if we don't get a response, uh, you know, we're, we're going to open up a seat in that section. Uh, we know that on this campus, we're short on comp one seats. We're short in chemistry. You know, we have waiting lists for all of these. And so we're going to move paying customers into that. At the end of the second week, we're going to drop these students. Randy Mayhall did some work for us that said uh, about 8% of the students last spring did not earn a passing grade. Not a single passing grade. Now, most of those probably were no-shows that never showed up. We've carried them. They'll get turned over to collections. We're not going to collect, right, Mike? I mean, it's just we're not going to we're not going to collect. There was another three percent of the students and some change that totally withdrew. So there's eleven percent of the students uh, that didn't earn a passing grade uh, last spring. That's not your fault. I mean, that's. We're going to get rid of those. That's going to help that 48.8% number. I don't know how much, but uh, I don't like being second uh, and being dead last uh, doesn't sit well. So again, as I've asked you before, we need to make sure that we are doing everything that we can to help our students be successful. I am not asking you to pass it. I'm not asking you to, to lower your standards. I am asking you to reach out to these students. If you see someone struggling, let's try to get them help. Invite them to your office if they're struggling. Let's see what, uh, what we can do to help. We know the students that we serve. And many of them come to us already defeated. They weren't successful or very successful in high school. They're beat up. They have no confidence. So let's see what we can do about that. At that point, at some point, it's on them that 
they do the work, they come to class, lead a horse to water, you can't make them drink. If they don't drink, then and you've done all your good, then I am absolutely satisfied. But this is uh, an area that, that we've got to uh, we've got to improve on is uh, is retention. All right, now let's move on to a fun slide. Oh, yeah, this is a good slide. Good slide. <laughs> this is, and it's hard to see, I know. What this says is that the, that the foundation over the past five years it has done a phenomenal job. And uh, uh, Dr. Fulton deserves a lot of credit. Dr. Blanton deserves a ton of credit. And uh, as we look through and we see that uh, compared to where we started out, five, six years ago where we are now with just our holdings, fundraising, the level of scholarships that we've given, uh, it is incredible. I would ask you to please, if you are not doing so, to make a monthly contribution to the foundation, even if it is just a dollar. What that does is when Ryan goes out and asks for money, and he can say 100% of our employees are contributing to the foundation. He's telling the truth. Okay? Not asking to give more than you can give, but uh, it will help Ryan's fundraising efforts and our fundraising efforts if we can walk around and say 100% of our employees are in. They're invested. Now here's the fun slide. <laughs> Can everybody see Raven's face? <laughs> this has been the bane of several folks' existence this year. And which we knew it would be an undertaking. And we knew it would be a little painful. I don't think we knew exactly how painful. Um, and we're, uh, we're told, we believe, that once everything gets implemented in here, uh, things are going to be hunky-dory. It's going to be much better. So uh, uh, Heath and the entire Banner implement, implementation team, that's all the front office, you know, uh, registrar, financial aid, the bursar, uh, HR, uh, academic affairs, everybody that's been in touch with us, thank you for your patience and your efforts. Because I know it hasn't been fun. It has always been the Connors way to give somebody a full-time job and then slap another one right on top of it. We had no intentions of slapping Banner right on top of that, but that's exactly what we did. And uh, as opposed to the folks in Stillwater who have tons of folks to throw at them, then uh, throw at these issues, we have folks with full-time jobs that uh, that are dealing with this. So uh, uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much. Little helps on the way from a credit hour standpoint. Uh, Connor State College has been approved, one of 67 schools in the country, to uh, uh, to offer second chance pay. That's pay for prisoners. Uh, we have a long history of working with Eddie Warrior and Jess Dunn with amazing results. One of the limiting factors out there for the past several years has been funding for these students. Uh, the women have a little foundation. The men, if, it wasn't, if it's not for tribes, uh, tribal pay, uh, and they have a hard time of, of going to school. Right now, we are... Uh, I believe Amber told me that she's got about a thousand credit hours worth of, uh, of enrollments that, that have yet to be put into the system. Uh, when it's all said and done, we have uh, we've been authorized to deliver two hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of pay to student to incarcerated students at any one year just now. Pretty significant number, and will help our bottom line uh, immensely. Uh, Dr. Blanton and his crew were pretty instrumental in writing that grant, uh, and we're, we're tickled to, 
to, uh, to have. Uh, something that uh, Joyce and, uh, and her crew have been working with uh, East Star Hospital. They approached us and, with an, an idea that uh, they wanted to create a residency program for their newly hired nurses. Uh, and actually they were approached by an outside company, and this is what we do, and, and Tony Young, the CEO, we don't need them. Let's talk to Connors and see what Connors can do. So this will be a program that will uh, essentially a continuing ed program that uh, we're looking at roughly 15 students, uh, uh, twice a year to complete this residency program. Uh, one of the uh, one of the labs in the Nursing Allied Health Building will be converted and we'll have the equipment just like as in East Star. And, uh, and those students will essentially get their orientation training through this program. And when they, uh, when they complete that and they, uh, they head to the, to the floors, they're going to be better prepared to do their job well. Uh, and I know our faculty will, be, uh, will, will take a role in this. I think we're helping with the curriculum development. Uh, this has an opportunity to be a, a pretty significant uh, uh, program for the institution. I appreciate the nursing folks for, for helping us make this happen. Uh, there's more details that uh, I probably need to hold off on uh, and the dollars that we're, that we're talking about, but it's, it's significant and, uh, and a great deal. Last year, this is a, we, the, the photo's not updated. What I wanted to show was the rotunda in, at the Port Campus. There was a problem last year whenever we moved everybody over to the Port Campus from West, and how are we going to handle, because we know the lines in the scope to get, uh, get long. And so uh, the employees got together, came up with an idea, Worked it out in the uh, in the rotunda, and I think things, Amber, and the rest of you that work at Muskogee, I think it works fairly smooth and help control the lines, control tempers, uh, and uh, great idea. And we need more of these. And so if you have uh, have something like this that can help us be more efficient, uh, save a little money, we want to hear. Whitney Tucker helped us with these uh, getting our uh, healthy, certified healthy campus awards again. We actually got three of them this time. Certified healthy business, certified healthy campus, and uh, I think a certified healthy program. Whitney? Uh, we received one certified healthy department. So four awards. Yes, Thank you for, for working on that. Uh, most of you know we had a Board of Regents meeting last year that, uh, that we showed up. The Regents were very happy with the way the campus looked and, uh, and with this, uh, uh, this picture's kind of cool. I think we'll be using this for, uh, for a number of years. We also, uh, uh, Named the shootings uh, complex and the uh, and the wetlands after Doc Woods, well deserved, and uh, uh, pretty good, uh, pretty interesting uh, to see the regents and uh, uh, you know their uh, their idea of competition and uh, you know whenever they matched up to one another and and, uh, and shot. Perry, I apologize. I I left a, a, a picture out. We also were able to, uh, in honor of Coach Key's 1500 win, uh, name the uh, the ballpark after Coach Key. And uh, if you haven't seen the sign out there, it's pretty cool. Had good luck with the bull sale last year. Now all that money doesn't come back to Connors, okay? 
that belongs to the producers. We uh, uh, we probably generate about uh, uh, about fifty thousand a year on that bull test with the fees that we receive. Equine Boys did a great job with uh, with their program. Had uh, good entertainment, good food. Smiling and Jerry McPeak there. This is one of the coolest events that I've been to. This summer, Coach Muse uh, had the idea that uh, we haven't played football since 1967. And the t-shirt said undefeated, right? Since since 1967. <laughs> but uh, uh, we had gentlemen come as far away as West Virginia uh, to attend this. Uh, 1949, I think, was uh, the fellow that went the, the furthest back. But uh, man, these guys had a good time and uh, it was great to get them back on campus and hear some of the stories about the way things were. And uh, uh, maybe we appreciate a little more of what we have because of, uh, of how they were forced to live and, uh, and the conditions of the campus at the time. That, uh, that they were. Coach Hughes, I appreciate your work on that. This was a cool deal. Fun. During the uh, alumni reunion, uh, Mr. Earl Streback uh, had an art show. He's pretty talented. And uh, uh, we appreciate, uh, appreciate his, uh, his involvement. Uh, Mr. Ogden donated another $100,000 for, uh, for the museum. That brings his total donation up to $400,000. Been over to Russell Hall. Uh, we've got the, the uh, Title III folks have moved in over there. It is really nice. That museum will be on the north end. That $100,000 is going to buy shelves, display cases, and some art. Uh, and uh, uh, I know Rebecca Clovis has been uh, working hard to uh, track down uh, art for us and uh, uh, to put on display. So uh, we appreciate it. Mr. Alden, uh, uh, very, very much. Scholars, Scholars and Honors Night was, uh, was a good event. That's kind of a happy family right there. Uh, this all gets an effort to save a little time. If we go at the top, Coach Keith won his 1500th game, as we, uh, as we mentioned. That's an incredible achievement, Coach. Uh, the golf tournament. Bill, how much money did you raise? $4,000. A good time was had by all. Aaron Ellis up here, if, if those folks that, that know Aaron, he is pretty quiet, pretty reserved, but you put him around Coach Keith and, and uh, his demeanor changes. <laughs> Coach Carvalho did go to uh, uh, Scobie High School. Uh, he left with 800 wins, which is a, again another great accomplishment. This is shooting sport team that uh, all jammed up over here, and they had a really, really good year. I think uh, Coach Miller has recruited another, another excellent set of sharpshooters that uh, uh, we're expecting them to to, to get to, to go even further. I think we're going to medal so. Uh, this is Mr. Jensen here from El Reno. He's an All-American uh, for the livestock judging team. Coach Deese, as was mentioned, is now the interim uh, softball coach. Coach Fisher, we brought him back on full time and uh, anxious to see him get to work and, and have, a, have a full squad to, uh, to work with and, and, uh, and practice with. Uh, Devin Sims was, the, uh, was an All-American and the uh, Region Player of the Year. Uh, uh, Lando Cook was uh, all-conference. And what I leave on him, Bill? I'm sorry? 
Okay, right. Paul Region and and, uh, and he uh, he is going to the University of Arkansas. Uh, several of those players that, uh, that did uh, uh, transfer to uh, Division One uh, schools. Here's uh, Caleb Knight, Jared Young, and Tim Smithson. All three were academic All Americans. Caleb Knight. I don't know if we got enough time to talk about all the awards he got. The uh, National Defensive Player of the Year. The Regional Goat Glove Team, or the, the National Goat Glove Team. I'm sure he was all conference and all of everything else. From just right down the road in Chicago. You know, we're, uh, we're really proud of him going to the University of Virginia. Uh, you know, we tried to keep him in state, but uh, uh, some of these local guys you know, might need to have their glasses adjusted, coach, for talent evaluation. He's a good, good kid. Jared Young, Canada, hit nearly 400. Uh, going Old Dominion, right? And then Tim Smithson, local boy. Coach had to go a long way to find him. He's from here in Warner. Academic All-American, he's going to the University of Arkansas. Fort Smith is going to play there. And uh, Jeremy Carney down here qualified for the college national finals. And uh, sounded like I had a little, little tough luck, but, uh, but represented, us, uh, represented us very well. And we're proud of, of these and, uh, and of all of our students that represent us in their, uh, in their different endeavors. We got the Phi Theta Kappa induction. The biggest Phi Theta Kappa class this spring that we're aware of. Commencement was another, uh, you know, a good show and good event. Uh, we're proud and, uh, and happy and, and pleased. And uh, the turnout that we had, and thanks everyone for who pitched, pitched in and helped us put that on. Uh, Nurse Penn, we pinned uh, last spring 48. 48 nurses, big group, big group. Uh, Warner Wellness Center. Connors was responsible for getting the wellness center here in here in town, and uh, they've now opened up the shop. So, so we have medical care in the big thriving community of uh, Warner. They just got uh, uh, approved. They've, they've purchased a couple of mobile dentist uh, clinics. And uh, so at some point in time in the near future, we'll have a dentist roll through town on a regular basis. We are, we're moving up. <laughs> Biggest Aggie Day, I think, that, uh, that we're aware of. They're right, Miss Golden, about 1,800 uh, contestants. Uh, from all over the state and uh, Texas and Arkansas and uh, Kansas. One of the biggest events that, uh, that we have on campus. Summer camps uh, went extremely well and uh, I think uh, uh, meaningful. We, uh, we appreciate uh, and are glad to, uh, glad to have them on, on campus. Uh, uh, our college fair is about the biggest in the state that I like, Logan. Yeah, but I, I don't, I'm not aware of one that, that sees any more students than that. So uh, uh, we're, we're, we're proud of that as well. Uh, the interscholastic competition, this cat right here was a hoot. He was mugging everything. It was, this is cool. John and Stacy at the, at the Oklahoma uh, Council for uh, Public Relations, uh, Oklahoma College Public Relations Association won lots of awards, uh, won the big award overall for the, for the campaign. We were up against all the big schools who hire national marketing firms to put their programs together and everything that all of our marketing materials that, that we send out from here are produced in-house. John and Stacy and uh, we went up there and, and showed the big boys how we do it down here. I'm really, really proud of it. And uh, 
some of the things that uh, that we've done. Did, yeah, I did. I think I would have liked to have been there when, you know, they keep this OSU and Oral Roberts, and I think Langston spent a ton of money on it on a campaign and rode through there and then and the winner is Connors. I'd like to see the face. <laughs> so uh, uh, we started uh, advertising on Pandora and I know none of you listen to Pandora on your uh, on your uh, on your work computers, but if you do you might hear what are you looking for in a college? I'm looking for a college that works with my schedule, one that helps me juggle my kids, my work, and my busy life. If you're looking for a college that's not too expensive and close to home, and one that accepts you no matter your age, check out Connor State College. We give you the opportunity to start or finish your degree. With two campus locations in Warner and Muskogee, and flexible online courses, you can learn on your time. You're always the right age to go to college, and you can improve your life with a click of a mouse. Log online to connorstate.edu to learn more. Recognize the voice. John Hines. Radio time. Uh, Connor's Choice Radio ad that we, uh, that we ran. Connor State College is proud to announce the Connor's Choice Scholarship. If you're a new or returning student with a high school diploma or GED and have already applied for FAFSA, you can apply for the Connor's Choice Scholarship. Available for full-time and part-time students, with preference given to non-traditional students, this scholarship is valued at half the tuition for up to 12 semester credit hours and up to two consecutive semesters. The deadline for the Connor's Choice Scholarship is August 15th. Learn more online at connorstate.edu. This is East Star Orthopedics, and this is kind of a, features one of our basketball players. In a heartbeat, your day can go from extraordinary to heartbreak. When you're injured, you need fast access to specialists who will provide treatment that will strengthen your recovery for a long-lasting success. E-Star Health System offers some of the nation's most advanced orthopedic procedures from highly experienced surgeons, helping the people in eastern Oklahoma regain the lifestyle they want. When your life changes in a heartbeat, we are here to help you return to the things you love. Kind of uh, a cool piece that, that uh, appeared on, uh, I think, local cable in, uh, in the show. Uh, can't get away with talking about uh, Drake and the job he's doing with our student activities. Connor's Got Talent was, uh, was apparently a big hit with Big Ronnie. Uh, I wasn't able to attend. Mike Jackson would kill to have Big Ronnie back. <laughs> Easter egg hunt that we do at, uh, at the Port Campus, one of the big events that they have up there, something that Derek has found that works that the, that the students will come out to. Fantasy Rodeo, and speaking of, of Mr. Drake, <laughs> he is an excellent, an excellent barrel racer on stickers. <laughs> I think one of the most meaningful things that we did last year was the, the Take Back the Night, and uh, this was all about sexual assault awareness. Uh, it is an issue on college campuses. Uh, at some point in time, my, I hope Mike Jackson is able to share some of the things that we've learned this past year as we started collecting information and uh, doing our, uh, our required training for, uh, for our students in sexual assault uh, uh, awareness. But uh, Dr. Dinger, Mike Jackson, Derek, the coaches, and everyone who participated in this event, thank you. And uh, it is something that we need to stay on top of, continue to talk about, and make sure that our students are very much, uh, very much in the know and they, and they understand that we're here to listen. Okay. What, what we tried to do is, uh, when we, Went back and you know, we talked about where we're at and the budget, what we're doing, how we're how we're managing that, um, and it uh, it comes back to this: we're going to get through the tough times. And 
I ran across this. Governor Henry talked about the Oklahoma standard. It means, means resilience in the face of adversity, strength and compassion that will not be defeated. And I think this is an attitude that, uh, that we're going to have to adopt around here for the near future. As things are going to be tough. It is going to, the budgets are going to be tight. We're going to continue to, uh, to try to figure out ways to deliver a world-class education to people who so desperately need it uh, and in a, an efficient a way as, uh, as possible. I want to leave you with this because there are so many people in this room that uh, that deserve to, you know, print this and put it on their back just because of how they stepped up and they've taken more responsibility and and uh, and did it in a in a positive manner. And so, thank you again for your efforts. Um, I can tell you that the, that the executive team and I are working hard to minimize the impact of any future budget difficulties. Again, we've got to have your help to do this. We can't do it alone. Um, and thank you for your attention. Uh, nobody fell out asleep. I, I appreciate that. And, uh, Thank you for what you do for our students. Uh, now, I suspect that everybody needs a uh, health break, as I've heard these discussed before. Thanks again, and let's go have a good year.